So good afternoon, everyone. I think we've got more seats than we need, but it, it makes us feel homely, doesn't it, in here? Um, so I'm delighted to be here, and we've got two great panellists. My name is, uh, is Tracy Isaac. I work for Silicon Valley Bank. Um, and just a little bit of background, prior to Silicon Valley Bank, I, I, I now run the relationships with the corporate uh, groups within uh, major corporates like Microsoft, Intel, Google. Um, but previously, I actually ran ventures and innovation for Telefonica, including the, uh, the Israeli team who, uh, who, who worked out in Tel Aviv. And I did actually spend two years living in Israel when I was uh, very young, so I have some extreme and fond memories of, of, of Israel. But I'd, l I'd love to, uh, to just ask Nagraj and Dharmesh to just take a bit of time to just introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your backgrounds, because you've both got very interesting backgrounds with more than one company. It'd be great if you could just share a little bit about what you've done. Uh, you have more interesting background than mine. So. <laughs> better okay thanks thanks again Tracy uh, uh, thank you for having me here so uh, just uh, briefly I'm Darmesh uh, Thacker I'm a partner with uh, Battery Ventures um, many of you guys probably know Battery you're pretty active in Israel but just for those who don't with 30 year old fund manage over 5 billion uh, we focus primarily on B2B software and you know, selling to the business buyers marketing tech finance tech and then the other half is uh, IT software, selling to CIOs, CISOs, chief data officers. Um, but we tend to take a slightly different approach, which is we're domain-centric. We've spent a lot of time in those domains. And within that, we can find companies any, at any stage, all the way from C to pre-IPO in US, Europe, and Israel. So I got a couple partners sitting in uh, Herzliya, looking at a number of companies in uh, storage, security, systems, extreme IO, cyber, and many others. Uh, and I spend most of my time here in the Valley looking at cloud, big data, security companies as well. Uh, prior to Battery, I did spend some time in the corporate side as well, invested uh, in enterprise uh, while at Intel Capital. Uh, and prior to that, on the operating side, uh, uh, in the systems management, kind of cloud infrastructure space as well. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tracy. So I, I didn't spend two years in Israel, but I've been there enough times that it feels like I've spent two years in Israel. Uh, so I, I mostly when I when I give these talks, I do call myself an honorary Israeli because I've been going there for I think eight or nine years and investing for almost the same time uh, as part of uh, my previous role where I was uh, leading Qualcomm Ventures. Uh, this particular role, uh, unlike Dharmesh, is only nine months old, so we don't have a 30-year history. Uh, it's uh, almost a brand new effort from Microsoft. We got started at the beginning of the year, and now I think we're up and running. Uh, the, from an Israel perspective, you start in the U.S. in the Bay Area, but uh, the first geography we got up and running after the U.S. was Israel, so we do have uh, an MD in Israel, the same person who used to work for me at Qualcomm is now uh, the uh, lead for Microsoft Ventures in Israel. And we have made, uh, in the short time we've been around, three investments in Israel. It just happens to be in the area uh, of security, but uh, we are much broader than that and we'll look for cloud infrastructure, uh, SaaS, security, AI, all of those things which uh, Israel is very strong in. So we'll fairly Fairly broad in that, uh, investing anything that uh, Microsoft touches. Um, and so since we started, we have been on a good pace in the US also. And we've, uh, I think, closed a total of 15 investments so far. So that's that's where we are. And pretty impressive in, in nine months. It's uh, it's huge. Uh, so, so one thing just to say as well is Silicon Valley Bank is very, very much present in Israel. We have around 14 people on the ground in Israel, I think about 350 clients and are lending at all stages from early stage to sort of mes. So uh, I did forget to just put that into my introduction. It's a very important part of what we'd like to, to make sure that we're, we're, we're sharing with you. So I think the, the theme of the, of the panel is really to just talk about investment trends. And it's been a, a pretty interesting year, I would say, this year. So it would be great to just get your perspectives on you know, what you've seen, especially sort of first nine months of this year, and where are we at now? What's, what's happening? Happy, happy to take it first. So um, you know, it's, it's a long cycle, so it's kind of hard to look at nine months and see if things have dramatically changed. But 
if I look at you know the last nine years, it's been probably one of the best bull runs in history, if you will, starting 2009. But more importantly, the last couple of years, um, there's kind of been this interesting divergence between fundamental company building and you know the investment bubble kind of uh, uh, crashing a little bit, if you will, for lack of a better term. So fundamentally, I look at companies and say, is there a need for the products they're building and are customers buying? And I've never been more bullish in terms of the number of secular trends that many startups are benefiting from, right? So this massive shift from you know buying boxes and spending three hundred billion in the data center to going to Azure or Amazon or Google, huge macro trend, uh, uncovering new insights from big data. And I happen to be fortunate as an investor in Cloudera, MongoDB, and many other companies that are mining net new data to help companies get more insights. And then obviously with all these changes, the attack surface increases, so cybersecurity innovation continues to be uh, pretty prolific. So fundamentally, uh, over the last nine months or the last nine years, the need for solutions in technology uh, is higher than I've ever seen in my operating career. And it's a very exciting time to be an entrepreneur. Uh, at the same time, there seems to be this mismatch between the fundamental value of companies and what VCs think that they're worth. Uh, that has adjusted in the last nine months. So for the last three years, a lot of companies were getting funded when they had no business getting funded or at valuations that were just unsustainable, right? And case in point, most of the IPOs that went out this year uh, have been at valuations lower than the last private round valuations, right? There's 150 companies sitting in this unicorn status. Uh, and the peak of the dot-com uh, surge back in 99, there were 22 of them, right? So there's seven times more companies valued at a billion plus, many valued at 10 billion plus, or 50 billion plus, as you know, uh, that just make no sense because there's no way, it's very hard to make a return from, from these companies when they hit the public markets, right? Whereas I think what's happened the last nine months is because the IPOs have priced that lower than their private valuations, or these valuations, these companies just stopped getting funded in the last nine months, there's been a return to normalcy where the late stage, fly by the night money that used to fund these companies and get them into bad habits has then evaporated overnight. Uh, and companies are fundamentally focusing on their business, profitability, valuing themselves as a multiple of revenue, not just a multiple of their last round valuation, uh, which is all very healthy for the market. So if fundamentally companies can add value and valuations are growing at a measured pace, everybody can make money uh, as opposed to you know, the hype in the valuation cycles, which doesn't really help anybody. So that's, I think, probably the, the biggest change I've noticed in the last, you know, nine to 12 months. Yeah, I think Dharmesh and uh, uh, we look at very similar things. So there isn't much new I'll add, but the, a couple of points. One is, even in the nine months, you could probably break that into the first three months of the year and the next six months. The first three months of the year were actually quite tough for, uh, for startups raising capital. I think there was a little bit of a freeze that seems to have uh, gotten much better. The money on the sidelines has come back. And I think there's clearly a return to normalcy in valuations, which I think is very healthy, as Dharmesh pointed out, for the long-term sustainability of the venture ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But I think the good news is, in, in even in the last you know, six, or maybe the three months, clearly there's more funding rounds happening, and there's a lot more uh, desire to, uh, to get things back on track in terms of the funding environment. We should you know, shut down quite a bit uh, in the first three months of the year. The, the second point of the secular trends, Dharmesh covered a number of them. Clearly, lots of uh, runway to get to cloud. That's uh, just going to take us uh, a long way. The other one that's fueling a lot of the venture ecosystem at this point is, the, is sort of the move to AI ML as a core part of almost every company. Now, I think it's a little overdone. I would like to s see pitches which don't throw in AI ML just for the sake of throwing those in. But that is another secular trend that will take us uh, to, to many, many more years of good innovation in this area. The last point, I think, is uh, interestingly enough, given the fact that we invest both in the US and Israel, we've actually seen a little bit of dichotomy in terms of valuations. The U.S. seems to, in this case, have corrected earlier than Israel, which is you know, great for folks here or entrepreneurs in Israel. I think we are seeing healthier valuations in Israel than we are seeing in the U.S. So we'll see if that's been an anomaly or uh, you know, it's really truly the fact that Israeli companies, like my colleague in Israel, will keep telling me it's better than U.S. companies. So you know, we'll, we'll find out. 
interesting. I think one of the other things that's been a pretty big trend over the last few years is the growth in corporate venture. Maybe, you know, I know both of you can talk on it, but what's your view on the on the changes that are happening there? I think there's, you know, the stats say that in the last four years we've gone from a thousand corporate venture units to fifteen hundred. And I think there's a new one being formed most weeks. So it would be good to just hear your views of sort of the good, the bad and the ugly of the corporate side of venturing. I'll let Dharmesh talk from a VC perspective, from a financial VC perspective. But from a corporate VC perspective, I think, uh, is, as everybody knows, corporate VC has gone through booms and busts in the past. By every measure, it feels like at this time it's here to stay. And the reason it's here to stay is uh, is fairly simple. Corporate balance sheets are pretty strong relative to when this last happened. The need for doing quote unquote off balance sheet R&D has really increased. And uh, there is really no other good way for corporations to keep track of innovations than through the corporate VC arms. So while 1,500 is probably not the right number, you can argue 1,000 is not the right number, but I don't think uh, this is a trend that's going to reverse in any meaningful way. Corporates are here to stay. I think there's 25% uh, of the funding is being provided by corporate investors. And I think the last panel, uh, I, while I was not there completely, I mean, you talked about autonomous vehicles. This is a great example of a sector that there is a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of fear among the industry that they don't want to get left behind. And so you're seeing a number of corporates entering from the auto sector and, and sort of, again, funding innovation that they wouldn't have done uh, even 10, you know, five, 10 years back. So I, this time, it clearly feels like it's here to stay. It's a good source of uh, funding for startups. Uh, one can argue what stage you want to take money from corporates. And you know everybody has different views on that. So I'll, I'll let Dharmesh talk to that one. But clearly, I think this is another trend that's here to stay. Maybe it's 500 is the right number for actual corporates. But regardless, 500,000 or 1,500, that's still a big number of corporates that are going to be here for the next 10 years. Yeah, and no, I, I, I agree. I think I've got the benefit of uh, seeing it from both sides. So the last the la uh, three years before I got the battery, I spent at Intel Capital, uh, the corporate venture arm of Intel. And now I'm on the other side working with many strategic partners like Microsoft and, and Intel and others. Uh, I think the, the first thing is why are corporates jumping in? I think Nagraj covered it, but just to illustrate the point, there's roughly $2 trillion, trillion on the balance sheet of the largest tech companies. Uh, and Wall Street doesn't really value them based on their balance sheets, right? They say, if you got sitting on cash, dividend it out to us. If you're not gonna dividend it out, then go invest for growth, right? So you kind of have this corporate dile dilemma. If I'm a tech company, I'm supposed to be a hard growth, cool company, uh, but I can't really cannibalize my existing business. Like if I'm HP, I'm not gonna say, screw selling boxes and storage and just put it on a public cloud. Like it doesn't work that way. Uh, some companies like Microsoft have done a better job at saying, hey, the world is going there anyway, so let's kind of figure out a hybrid path of public-private. Uh, but for corporates who see customers change direction, go to the cloud, adopt net new data sources, adopt net new kind of cybersecurity measures, you can sit still and wait for somebody to start eating into your business and then pay up a huge price to acquire the company. Um, or you can say, let me have my eyes and ears on the ground to see what's new, build a relationship with these companies beforehand, uh, and if nothing else, be more informed about what's going on in my customer base. And so I think the fundamental uh, need for corporate venture stems from the fact that a lot of things are changing in corporate IT, and they can't afford to sit still. Uh, and they have a lot of money that you know, they can either give away to their investors as a dividend or uh, pursue expensive acquisitions. So this is kind of a fine balance between saying, how do I get the best of uh, know-how on what's happening uh, without overspending? Now, corporate venture, when done right, can be very beneficial to uh, kind of financial VCs and entrepreneurs as well. Because, you know, while on one hand, the R&D budgets of many startups have gone down dramatically because you can use the cloud or you can use open source, you don't have to spend you know, 10, 15 million dollars to get your MVP out, the cost of sales and marketing still continues to be very high for many startups, right? Because you can build a product, but then you have an expensive sales force and marketing force to figure it out. When you work with a corporate partner whose incentives are aligned with you, the go-to-market assistance they can provide you, the technology access they provide you, that can really help you cut down your sales marketing and provide access to customers you wouldn't have on your own. So, you know, in our IT investments, we partner up with 
many corporate investors, you know, for example, EMC on the storage side is great because it gives us access to their their long ro long range mod roadmap on media investments, their customers where we can go sell together. Uh, and you know, we have companies like Elastifile, Extreme IO, Accelero, many from Israel, all of them are from Israel, uh, that work with EMC. And I think in the same way, we work with Intel, Microsoft, because it's a win-win situation for both sides. So I think it's here to stay, and there are some that know how to do it right. Uh, probably I'd say 10, 10 out of the 500 who know how to do it right versus uh, the other guys who are still trying to figure it out. You want to name any names? <laughs> I, I think, like I said, we, we end, end up working with, you know, Intel, EMC, Microsoft, uh, Google, uh, and a few others. Yeah. Actually, it was interesting last week, Dalmesh and I were both at the Intel Summit, and I thought the way that Wendell actually laid out what strategic investing is all about is one of the sort of the simplest explanations I've seen, which was basically you have business units in the organization who are trying to adopt a strategy and the, the strategy can go a little bit up and down but it's basically going in a direction and if they have fundamental gaps within that they should be buying companies but if they want to do something that's a little off strategy but could take them and accelerate them that's when they should be investing um and, and I think that's one thing that Intel have done pretty well. I know they've gone sort of financial and more strategic over time, but I think they've done, you know, overall a very good job of doing that. So, so maybe just a, a little bit of a deeper dive into the... the I know you've, you've sort of briefly mentioned the areas that you're focused on, but, you know, for the startups in the room, how best to approach you? Because I think you've used sort of fairly broad topics like cloud. You know, are there any deeper areas within that that you're looking at, and how would an entrepreneur come and approach you if they wanted to talk with you? Yeah, I, I can go first. So I think, look, it, there's two separate questions. So one is what are the subsets of innovation yeah. that are interesting? And second is how do you approach uh, an investor? Uh, I could sit here for another two hours, talk about subsets <laughs> of you know, cloud and data. But needless to say, there are some macro trends of you know, decoupling um, infrastructure hardware from you know, the applications, if you will. So do you really, if I'm Goldman Sachs, do I really care? where my wealth management application is running physically. Like, it doesn't really matter whether it's in a public cloud or a container or serverless for that matter. So there's some fundamental innovation that's allowing you to focus on software development and innovation that impacts your customers versus running hardware. Most companies figured out our core competency is not running hardware, so why are we bothering with it, right? So that's kind of the macro trend of, uh, you know, of, of cloud computing and a hybrid cloud. And we see plenty of innovation Many from kind of Israeli entrepreneurs, uh, because of their prior training from the 8200 or Talpia or what have you, you see a lot of innovation coming out, enabling the next generation of, you know, uh, cloud computing and uh, how do you separate out the hardware away from, you know, the container you run it in or microservice you run it in. In the data space, there's AI, ML, deep learning, deeper learning. There's all elements of uh, of learning, but we tend to look at vertical applications, right? So. Technology is a means to an end. What business problem is it solving? And I think in data, uh, it's more pronounced than anything else. You know, I can't tell you how many companies I see which have a slightly better algorithm than random forest for machine learning. I'm like, so what? You know, is it going to help? You know, financial institution figure out a fraudster quicker. Is it going to help a retailer figure out? You know, how to target a high value customer and convert them better. Like, what is the business application you do you enable? And so we're much more focused on vertical apps powered by AI, ML, as opposed to just the, the algorithms by itself. So those are some examples of innovation that we look at, among others. And there's IoT, autonomous cars, and the like. So we look at 6,000 companies a year uh, across you know, those broad trends of cloud, data, and security. Uh, so that's kind of the broad ground we cover. But I think in terms of approaching investors, um, if there's a couple of lessons that might be worth, worth the while for you guys, I think just like I try to research who am I meeting with, looking at the LinkedIn profile, figuring out what they've done before, so I'm a bit more prepared. Uh, I often see investors will come to us and say, hey, look, we are two guys with an idea to go build something, uh, and we need 500000 for incubating it, which is great. But you know, we are a $950 million fund. It's hard for us to write a $500,000 check. So understanding like what is the size of the fund, what, who you're talking to, you know, what is the, the typical criteria they look at, our sweet spot is finding out, hey, do you have a product? Have you figured out product market fit? Uh, we write plenty of blogs on that. How do you achieve product market fit and scale the business? 
So if you're looking for a Series A, Series B, we can certainly help in the areas that we're interested in, right? But if you're a seed stage company or if you end up being a buyout company in oil and gas that is looking to, you know, sell uh, positive cash flow stories, it's just kind of do a little bit of research on which fund you're talking to because there are funds that will do that. But not every fund is going to invest in every company. So that's kind of one uh, piece of advice. And then the second piece of advice I would say is, yeah, oftentimes I think entrepreneurs get carried away by, hey, I heard about this other company in my space that just got valued at a billion. Uh, I'm six months behind, so I should release half as much. Uh, and it almost, I, I kind of look at that and say, if you're in company building mode, focus on the problem you're solving. Are you growing efficiently? And can you get to $100 million in recurring revenue? And if you can, then you know the market will figure out what the eventual value is. And you shouldn't worry about what other people are getting valued at, because all those guys that are valued at a billion are going to have a very hard time uh, trying to figure out an exit if they don't have real revenues. right? So using those comms don't really help. Focus much more on product market fit, what fundamental ROI are customers getting, and how far will this round of financing take you so you can then raise your next round at an even higher valuation. So kind of focusing on fundamentals versus the hype. Uh, I mean, it's, it's common sense, but it's, it's surprising uh, often uh, uh, we, we don't really see it that prevalent. So just a couple of tidbits that might help you as you prepare for your venture pitch. I think I'll, uh, I'll take off what, uh, what one of the things Dharmesh said is sort of you know who you're pitching. And from our perspective, it's uh, somewhat easy to research us. We are, we are part of Microsoft. So in general, we'll invest in areas that are interesting to Microsoft. We obviously have a website. We've laid out most of the things. But it's always good to know who you're pitching to. So we'd be interested in things that fundamentally can take Microsoft in a different direction, or where we can help partner the startup to get go-to-market help that, as Ramesh said, would be helpful uh, to a startup. So it's always good to look at that. So the broad areas that are aligned with our different, uh, I said, business divisions, which would be cloud, uh, anything with SaaS, business SaaS, productivity and communications, and then you know anything that advances the Windows ecosystem. So those are very broad themes. If you figure that you as an entrepreneur are solving a problem for any of those, uh, we'd be interested because, again, we are really fairly broad. We are somewhat stage agnostic, except that we would also not do seed investments. We start at Series A. The other filter for us is typically we'll co-invest with folks like their mates. So we will not lead rounds early on. So I think a lot of the folks that come to us will say we are an ISV partner for Microsoft and you should put money in us. A lot of the businesses are actually good ISV partners, and they're good lifestyle businesses, but they're not be good venture businesses. So think of the venture group as top of the funnel, which means that there's a variety of ways to partner with Microsoft, and we can help you with that. But not every company that's a partner to Microsoft is a good venture investment, and we cannot do that anyway. I mean, it's if we try to invest in every company that's a partner to Microsoft, we'll be doing you know five investments a day. So, so there's some amount of filtering that goes on that is, you know, you have to be self-aware when you approach us. And if you have done your homework, I think that makes for the best approach and the best pitch. In terms of how to contact us, of course, I think we've, we have a website where you can apply. You, uh, if you're in Israel, uh, it's, it's not hard to find Moni. And if you, have, if you tell me it's hard to find Moni, then we're doing something wrong. Uh, but uh, but you, know, you can approach us, or I think it's best to just approach uh, folks on the ground uh, in the regions where, you, where we have physical presence. And we have physical presence in Israel. If you're a physical person in the Bay Area, if you're a US company, obviously come here. But if an Israeli company coming here, while Moni has said no, will just mean that we'll have to say no again. I mean, it's it's sort of approaching. Many times we've also seen that, you know, if you get say no somewhere else, then you'll come to another person. And that also is, doesn't build confidence in the entrepreneur. So you, you just have to go to the place where you will we'll get the investment done. And in our case, it's fairly strict. Where we'll do the investment in the region where you, the company is based. So understanding all of those are important. And I think if after all of that, you can't uh, reach us, uh, it's very easy to reach me. I'm just nagaraj at microsoftventures.com. Happy, uh, happy to take an email from any of you. And, and I, think, I think one of the other things that we've seen as a, as a trend that's emerging with some of the financial VCs and certainly with, with the corporate VCs is just helping, helping portfolio companies with the business development of those companies. And it'd be interesting to just hear what you guys are both doing. I know, I know you've been working on how do you integrate with such a big organization, and it'd be good to hear from you, Damaj. Yeah, look, I think, I think I'll say a couple of things that are pertinent to the audience here. Uh, and much like Nagaraj, because we invest in US, Europe, and Israel, uh, 
we end up having the situation where there's a lot of Israeli tech companies that start there but eventually move here and want to approach customers. So we play a pretty active role helping them. But I think I'll make a quick comment also, which is, you know, four or five years ago when I got into venture, there was a steady stream of, you know, some really solid technologists that came out of the IDF or the 8200 unit or some subset thereof, which are very well-known guys who had practical experience working in the IDF, and their mission was to go build a killer technology, get it to a couple of, you know, uh, early customers, and at that point, there were enough buyers to take them out for two, three hundred million, and that worked, that worked great, right? Uh, a lot of people that I talked to have been surprised that has kind of slowed down as of late, and I think there's a fundamental shift that has happened, which is five years ago, if you build a technology and you sold it to EMC, EMC had the burden of figuring out how to go sell it to their customers, right? Whereas today, customers aren't buying from EMC because they don't want to have the burden of you know, making technology work. They're buying from the cloud because they want to pay for business outcomes, not for technology, right? So if you're a technology entrepreneur, you have something that works, uh, you can't just throw it over the wall and you know, have a company buy it and then figure out what to do with it. You better be prepared for the long haul of figuring out how does it work as a cloud service where I'm delivering ultimate business value to the customer as opposed to just proving, you know, providing cool technology to, uh, to, to acquirers. Uh, be prepared for the long haul, be focused on delivering value as a cloud service, getting real ROI from the solution you build. Uh, and what that means is you have to invest in sales, marketing, and go to market uh, early on in your career. So you can't spend two, two and a half years sitting in a lab and building cool technology. You almost have to do iterative development with many of the early adopter customers in the US. So at Battery, for instance, we have a full-time staff of people. Their job is to maintain relationships with the top 50 kind of CIOs who have publicly stated their desire to go to you know, public cloud or hybrid cloud. We work with them very early on with our Israeli companies and say, hey, we have this thing in alpha stage. Uh, how do we test it out? How do we take Capital One or GE or Netflix or Uber, all the guys who want to adopt you know, hybrid cloud services and work with them even before the product is GA so we can figure out how do we make them successful. When the product is GA, we partner up with strategics like Microsoft or Amazon or others to say, hey, how do we collectively work on the go-to-market? Because uh, ultimately, unless we do that and unless we make you know dozens of cloud customers successful, it's going to be very hard for the company to either get the next round of financing at a healthy step up or... Um, you know, have, have exit options down the road. So I think business development today is even much more important because the burden of success is on the vendor, not on the customer who's just buying, you know, software. Uh, and so I think it plays a very active role in terms of, uh, of helping them connect to those CIOs and working with strategics to have a, uh, have a solution. Yeah, I think uh, uh, just as Ramesh pointed out, what we are trying to do on the BD side is to actually help the companies that Dharmesh funds or we fund, and it doesn't really matter to us, really. I think the way we look at it is, if we can provide value to Microsoft through a company, whether we have funded it or some other VC has funded it, will help out. And so to that end, what we have done is, from a team structure perspective, we have hired invest the investing team primarily from outside of Microsoft, but we're building a business development team primarily from all from within Microsoft. And the philosophy there is to take a company, whether it's a portfolio company or one of uh, a friendly VC's company, and sort of say, how can Microsoft help help out? And the variety of ways to help out. I think GTM is the one that comes up a lot because that provides some scale uh, and sort of helps the startup not having to hire you know, X number of salespeople if they can use Microsoft sales uh, to sort of co-sell. That sort of comes up a lot. So we're trying to build a team where we can qualify companies to say which company would our sales team be also incented to sell? And I think you know, there's, there's categories of companies that work well with the incentive structure the sales team is set up, and there's categories of companies that don't work well. If the sales team incentives are not set up the same way that the, for a startup, then we can provide some marketing help. But either way, we're trying to build up a, a team that is primarily uh, sort of a Redmond-based team or a Seattle-based team that is from all sorts from within Microsoft where they can almost handhold a company and get to the right uh, stakeholders, whether it's the product team, whether it's the sales team, the marketing team, to say, how can we make the company successful with Microsoft? So that's actually a very key part of the, the building exercise we're going through as a new VC. And that is the only reason, eventually, you know, in sort of a year, year and a half, 
why a company would come and take money from Microsoft versus you know just taking money from VCs and calling it a day. The reason to take money from Microsoft is not because you know there's no there's shortage of money. There's no shortage of money in the Valley or in Israel. The reason to take money from us versus uh, anybody else is to make is because we provide that leverage uh, with the use of Microsoft resources. And I just again, there's no one size fits all, but that's a clear competence we're building, and that's sort of ultimately how we'll be measured as a corporate strategic investor. Just one more thing to mention, Tracy, is uh, the other trend I've noticed as it plays to assistance to companies is increasingly more and more kind of infrastructure companies are uh, are taking the open source approach because customers want to buy open source as opposed to be locked into vendors, right? I have a couple of my colleagues here in the audience as well doing a lot of work on profiling open source companies and learning from the lessons of you know the Clouderas or the MongoDBs or you know the Red Hats of the world. Uh, which is a fine line. It's a very fine balance between building an, a vibrant community and still figuring out how to be, a, way, a way to make money. Right. So it doesn't have to be at odds with each other. There are plenty of examples of companies that have built a viral community and yet figured out a way to consistently monetize on it. And so that's something that a number of Israeli startups we now see who come from a systems background, more infrastructure, uh, are coping with. And so that's another topic that comes up very often where we find you know, another database or cloud or container company which has to be open source because that's the way most customers prefer to buy it. Um, and we spend a lot of time helping uh, figure out you know, how, do you, how do you do the right licensing model, the right paywall, the right land and expand model, um, learning from other companies that we've been a part of. So that's another element of go to market, which is very different than you know, having feet on the street and talking to CIOs. It's kind of developer led creating a community and creating a, a paywall as part of it. So whether your your approach is you know, systems level sale through sales guys, where we partner up with strategic partners, or uh, a grassroots adoption method of you know, land expand in the open source uh, community, uh, we, we spend a lot of time helping our companies on both fronts. So a, li a little bit of a switch of tech. Um, I think we've just got about four or five minutes left. Uh, and if anyone did have a question, does anyone want to ask? They've got two amazing guys here on stage. Anyone have a question that they'd like to ask? You can catch them later if you've got anything you want to ask them. I think one of the, it, you know, I'd love to know whether the, your view is that this is a trend, but we are, I think, you know, Sequoia just announced that they've hired their first female partner. I'd just love to know your view on kind of diversity and the trends in diversity and maybe how that's impacting you and what you're doing. Look, I think, it's, I think it's a great thing. So, you know, Battery, we have a senior general partner. Chelsea has been a part of the, the team for quite some time here, several, 10, 15 years now. We have a number of our CEOs who are increasingly women entrepreneurs. And I think look, it's a great thing, because if you look at uh, the tech ecosystem at large, and we see in particular the division between men and women is not at all a proxy of what you see in the general kind of workforce. So having diversity in the workforce, uh, having more uh, women entrepreneurs and VCs representing the ecosystem, I think is a very positive change. And I'm happy to see you know, Sequoia and many others kind of take proactive measures in the space. So. Yeah, of course. I mean, we, we completely believe that more uh, from not only from the Microsoft Ventures perspective, but from Microsoft perspective. I mean, I think if you think of not only just the workforce, but the end consumers, when the end consumers are diverse, when the buyers are diverse, uh, you need to have diversity of thought in who is funding companies. And sort of not only we're seeing entrepreneurs that are, are there's women entrepreneurs, but there's also, uh, I think, clearly, as I mentioned, an increase in number of VCs uh, that are women. So for, our, for us, we started building that. There's a luxury of building a new group. And I think uh, not everybody has a luxury of building something new every time. So, But I, I did have that. And so we have built the group from the ground up to look look and feel like the, the general population. I think we have, uh, uh, proud to say, almost 50% uh, women in the group. And it's been an amazing, amazing experience because you just hear different kinds of approaches. You hear different thoughts when the companies come pitch to us. Something that, you know, a, just a homogenous group wouldn't have been able to, uh, to gather or to get the insight. So for us to be successful in the long run, We've always believed that diversity is important, and I think uh, we are showing that with our actions and how we're building the group. Right. So I think that's a very good trend, and I'm very pleased with what you're saying. Um, so final one, after AI, which is the sort of most hyped discussion right now, what's next? What's coming next? What's the next trend? 
I think that's why we are the VCs and yeah, not the yeah, entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, if, if, if I tell you what the trend is, that's <laughs> not a good idea. I think you tell me what the trend is and I, I'll fund you. So I think that's, that's how it goes. Yeah, I, I agree with that <laughs> sentiment completely. You know, somebody, a good friend of mine asked me, he's like, what is the, what is the, uh, the hottest company, you know, that was the question? I think he said, uh, what is the best idea you expect to come this year? I'm like, look, <laughs> if I knew it already, I'm in the wrong business. It's the one that I haven't thought about before, which is going to ca- you know, catch us uh, left field. Uh, so, so. so these guys in the audience can come and tell you what their next That's idea right, is. That's right, absolutely. So thank you so yeah. much. Thank you for, for being great guests. Thank you. Thank you.